chapter 2, verse 1. Beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can, we, can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, 
could not speak unto you as spiritual, as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for wherever there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? I want to talk about a few things that we see in chapter 2. You know, when we come to Christ in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost comes on us. We're led by that. We're converted. We're regenerated by it. We're supposed to be. But when we look around at the things that we do, the things that we think about, the things that we say, the way we are with one another, are we spiritual? Or are we carnal? In Romans, Paul tells us to put away the old man. Put on a new man. But when we continue to focus on things of this world above and beyond the things of the spirit that we're supposed to be focused on so that we're prepared to be of service to God, we are being carnal. We've still got a foot in the wrong side. Why did Paul speak to the Corinthians about this, the church in Corinth about this? Because they had divisions in the church. They had strife, they had anger, they had backbiting, they had guile, they had all these things that were not to have. Do we not have them today? Amen. We have them everywhere we go. We have them in our churches. When we're more focused on the things that we're concerned about than the things that the Spirit is directing us to be focused on, we are the carnal mind. We are the carnal man. And we know that those things of man are an enmity to God. And we've got to step away from them. But we struggle with that. You know, we're told we have not we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. If this is the case, why will we get into arguments about things that are not spiritual? that are of this world. We'll argue about money. We'll argue about the things we want, the things we want to do, the lack of understanding we're getting from someone else. I want pity. I want whatever. We start to argue. We become contentious. In other scripture, Paul tells us contentiousness, contentiousness is not of the church. It is not our way. It's not the way we do things. When things are brought on us, if we, as I said before, step back and take a look and consider what's in front of us, we can be led to the understanding that we need to handle it the way the children of God are to handle it. But when we decide, I, I heard Brother Eddie talk about it this morning, some of the boys bowing up. When we decide it's okay to bow up on each other and become confrontational, that's carnal. Amen. And that's the direction that a lot of us go. He hurt my feelings. She hurt my feelings. They're talking about me. They're doing this behind my back. What a guy. See it for what it is. But if you get caught up in it, you don't see it for what it is. You don't see the malicious intent of the person that's doing the very thing that you're getting angry about. You need to step back and see what the Word of God has told us, which is what these things are, and that we're not to get caught up in them. We're not to become a part of them. That doesn't set you up here and set them down here. It just sets you apart as that peculiar people that you're to be, because you can't be peculiar if you're part of this world. You can't be a pilgrim. You can't be a sojourner because you're part of this, and you're not to be part of it. You need to learn from it, be exercised under it, be strengthened by the trials and the afflictions that are put on you. But you're not to become part of it. You 
can't, you can't go on a social media site today without seeing anger, hate, frustration, belittling, harassment. Why go on to it? Why become a part of it? Because what those things translate into are the same actions and deeds that you do when you're amongst your brethren or amongst those that could be drawn to Christ. The example that you set, what others see in you, is what we're supposed to be, not what the rest of the world is. But we'll go there very quickly. We'll go down that path. But when we have, have we received the spirit of the world or the spirit of God? Which spirit dwells within us? Because if we take the time to think about what we're saying and what we're doing, it becomes very clear very quickly. Verse 13, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual. We go to school, we do gain education while we're in this place of things of the world so that we can do what we need to do, understand the basic mechanics of how this place works. But that's what you're doing. You don't use those teachings to read the Word of God. Amen. The way you analyze an electrical engineering book or an algebraic equation or a scientific experiment or a theory, you don't apply that. To the Word of God. You have to be led spiritually by the Spirit that's to be in you to gain understanding, to have your discernment strengthened, your understanding provided. I don't understand all of it. God reveals it as I need to know what I need to do or what I need to say and who I need to say it to. I don't assume or suppose to have the answer. If someone asks me something and I don't know, that's what I'm going to say to you. I don't know. He hasn't revealed that to me. We can go to him in prayer together, or you can go to him in prayer yourself, whichever we're led to do, but I'm not going to make an assumption. Preaching the gospel is a very tenuous thing. My heart just kind of palpitates every time I get up and start to talk because I know he's listening to every word, he's watching everything I do. I'm under great scrutiny because I can't embellish on the word of God. I can give examples that maybe we can understand in our life experiences in this place as pilgrims and sojourners, I can't alter it. I can't change it. When it hurts, it hurts. These are the, the words of God. These are not my words. And when he's, when Paul is standing before a church or writing a letter to this church and saying, you have division, you have strife, you have all these things that you're not to have. He's not saying you don't have the spirit. He's saying you're trying to sit on the fence. And you're not to do that. You can't really come to know God and understand how we're to be if you want to keep mingling in the world. Keep being like those of the world. It's one or the other. You know, when we're called, examples of being called to Jesus. When Paul and Silas went to Damascus, 
And I mentioned this last week. There was a woman named Lydia who was present and heard Paul speak. When she heard the gospel, she received a call and was moved to begin to do the work. Now when Paul and Silas were thrown in prison, we have the other end of the spectrum. The prison guard heard the call when the earthquake hit. And the jail cell doors flew open and he was about to jump on his sword and kill himself because he thought all the prisoners had gotten away and he was going to be put to death anyway. And Paul called out to him and said, don't harm yourself, we're still here. And the guard ran in <coughs> and, uh, and said, tell me what I need to do to be saved. That's opposite end of the spectrum. Some hear the call of God by hearing the pre preaching of the gospel, the words of the gospel. And that's the intent of the gospel, to understand there is a way to get out of the quagmire of this world. Others, something life-changing has to happen to us. I've shared in the past, a life-changing event for me was successful career path, bad choices, and a big tumble. And then having the course correct, and try to figure out what to do next, well, then God shows me that that was my plan all along. I was going to drop you off the edge of that cliff and wake you up. It was eye-opening. But that's the way he works. For some, it's the subtleness of hearing the gospel and being led to Jesus to understand that only through him can we come under grace and become, start to become and eventually become the servants to God that we're being. In verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? and walk as men. If we go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, I'm going to read through this a little quickly. Paul talks about putting off the old man. And this is kind of a condensed version versus Romans where he really goes into this much more depth. That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Can we do this on our own? Are you, are you able to do this? Any of this? Because if we think we can do any of this on our own, we don't need Jesus, do we? Were you doing it before? Are you doing it now? No, you're not. I hear the things that come out of everyone's mouth. I hear about punching somebody, tripping somebody, knocking somebody down, going to get even with somebody. And I'm talking to more of the younger folks that are in here as you're out playing. That's not playing. That's playing at going to hell. Thank you, the devil. And then when we get into the older group, there's the backbiting, the infighting, the disagreements, the unwillingness to correct, the unwillingness to talk through things and understand and see what we need to do and what we need to know and how we need to act. All of these things 
are going on. They're going on here. They're going on everywhere you go. Because if you'll do them here, you're definitely going to do them out there. This is supposed to be God's house. And if we come in here doing and saying the things that we do, or not doing the things that we're supposed to do, why would we do them out there? If the understanding that this is his house is with us here, then we're incapable of living in the spirit, behaving in the spirit, speaking in the spirit, why would we ever think to ourselves that we do it out at our job, at home, amongst friends? We won't. We'll continue to do far worse than we do here. We need to always remember everything we've said, everything we've done up to this point in our life has been recorded. God has a record of everything we've done. That's the responsibility of his angels, to record the deeds of men. And he doesn't forget, and it'll be played back to you. If you're truly not walking with Christ. The biggest problem we have is we get so distraught and caught up in the events that have no effect on our salvation that we start to slip and tumble and fall. It's an election year next year. I see so much garbage about two thieving, lying, murdering individuals, and everybody wants to know who you're going to vote for. There's two other candidates. Investigate them. Is it a vote for one of the other two? I don't know. But is it a vote that you need to cast? I don't know. We need representation, yes, that has godly principles and foundation and moral and value structure. Are we getting that? No. So let's argue about it. Let's get in a tussle about it. Let's tell each other how foolish we are about our lack of awareness and understanding. Let's deride one another. And then let's go off and talk about what we just did. See, that's what everybody's doing. That's what everybody's doing. It's the same thing when someone has a struggle. Personal struggle, emotional struggle physical struggle. It doesn't matter what it is. We don't know what it is. We don't understand why it's happening. We don't understand where they're at. So let's talk about it. Let's pick at it. Let's worry over it for no reason. But let's not go talk to them. Let's not see what's really going on or understand what's really going on. Let's not be led by the spirit that we proclaim is in us. Let's just do what the rest of the world does. Are we? Is that what, how we handle our problems? Is that how we handle the struggles of life? We just do it the same way the rest of the world does. That's what they all do. We need to be truthful with ourselves. God already knows the answer to that question. And it's already been recorded. Every time we've done the very thing we're not supposed to do. If we think he's not looking at us right now, then what do we truly know? Are we truly spiritual or are we carnal? He's looking at you every moment of every day. We, we had songs this morning. <clears throat> How many of us really felt the words of 
those songs in our hearts. The author of the song does. When they write the song, that is the state that they're in, spiritually. And they're led to create this song, to sing praise to God. But do the rest of us, when we say those words, are we in the same spiritual place that they were in? If we can't treat our brothers and sisters as we should, I would have to argue that those words don't really mean a lot to us when we're saying it. It's just the mood of the music, like it is in the rest of the world. Put off the conversation of the old man. What does that really mean? What's Paul telling us? Put off the conversation of the old man put on the news. He's saying stop doing what the rest of the world is doing. Stop getting caught up in the craziness of the social media, the craziness of the debates, the arguments. Jude tells us verse 3 that we are to, be, that we are to contend for the faith. And, and when he does that, he's talking about being wary of false teachers, false preachers that we need to contend for the faith. We need to understand God's word so that we can discern the difference of being led astray and led or enlightened in the correct way. But Paul and others tell us to never be contentious. Yeah, because we can't put off the world, we want to keep a foot in the world of carnality, we can't do that. We want to argue. We want to make our position known. We want to press to be right. It's not about being right. It's about being righteous. Amen. It's about truly glorifying God, seeking to be holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. That wasn't just a passing phrase that was used. That is what we're to strive for. Holiness, true worship and praise to God, glorifying Him in our actions, our words, our thoughts, and our hearts. But as long as we want to take up a, a torch for the world, we can't do that. As long as we want to get up, caught up in the same debates and arguments that others are, we can't. We'll continue to be a part of this world. When we leave today and our first thought is about turning on something on TV, we're not. The Lord brought conviction on me the other day. I sat down in my recliner. I had mentioned before that TV was a problem for me in the past, especially racing. And I sat down, I was going to read the Bible, and the TV came on. Guess what I did? I looked at the TV. An hour and a half later, I'm still looking at the TV. And I'm still on the same page of his work. So I got up and I went to a different room. Just that quick, we go the wrong way. We'll make the wrong choice. That is why we have to be led by the Spirit. In the flesh, we're incapable ourselves. We can't do it. <clears throat> and if we're to be regenerated, the spirit has to be in control. If we're not seeking the things of eternity, Jesus told us, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. If we're not seeking those things of eternity, we're making the wrong choice. We're doing it ourselves. He's not in control. He's got to be in control. If we're going to truly get there, He's got to be in control. We've got to be in complete submission, obedience, surrender. I mentioned once before, to me, surrender is a here, as we understand things obedience, submission, surrender. Surrender, just envision, and I know Tony will understand it, your hands go up. Anything you do from that point is futile. 
You're not in control. You've given it all over to somebody else. Somebody else is in control. And that's Jesus. And that's what we have to do. The hands have to go up. The knees have to become bent. We may even have to lay prostrate on the ground. Just give it all over. And until we do, we have it. Until all the baggage, all the ill will that you've held on to for 20 years, until it's all gone, we have it. When we have a disagreement, we need to have a debate, not an argument, out of anger, hatred, a debate. Offer your position, I'll offer mine. We may never meet in the middle, and that's okay. We may agree to disagree, that's okay. Give a scriptural basis, of course, there's always final word. But when it comes to these things in the world, who cares? If it's not a soul you're trying to save to herd or lead in the direction that Christ wants them to go to come to him, who cares? You're not taking any of it with you. And nobody that's left behind is going to want it anyway. We've got to get focused on truly understanding what it means to be the spiritual man. Because I can tell you with certainty, that's where we're supposed to be. Jesus tells us, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. The branches that don't bear fruit, God plucks them off. Cast them to the ground, they come along, they sweep them up, and they go into the fire. Those that produce fruit, God prunes them. So that they produce fruit more abundantly. Are we producing fruit? Or are we in jeopardy of being plucked off the vine because we want to keep doing it ourselves? If you have a difference with someone, if you don't understand why you feel frustration with someone, you better go talk to them. Be angry, but not let not the sun go down on your anger, your wrath. That's what Paul's saying. If you're frustrated, if you're unsure, if you're uncertain, you don't know why you feel the animosity or whatever it is you feel towards someone else or the brother or sister, Better talk to them. Better talk to them. Because just as we've been told that we need to be cautious if we ask for forgiveness for our transgressions without having forgiven the transgressions of our brother, it's the same principle. Don't think the day is over when you've got unfinished, unfinished business. There's some strife, some division between you and another member of the body of Christ, you better go fix it. Because I guarantee you, the longer you let it go, the longer it hangs out there, the more it festers and becomes far worse than what it started out as. Think of an abscess. Well, it, think of a blister. A blister starts out little, and then it gets bigger as it fills up with water. That's what your problems do might start out little. You disagreed on something. And then by the time you got done talking to this one over here, and they got done talking to that one over there, and then they went and talked to three others, and five others, and 20 others, all of a sudden, it's an earthquake. And the longer it goes, the bigger it becomes. And the more in jeopardy you are. The more in jeopardy they are. If we're truly led by the Spirit, we won't let those things go undone. We will take them head on. With the assurance that that's what we're supposed to do. In all things. Big, small, 
gigantic. And we don't have to wait till we're grown ups to do it. It starts when we're children as well. We've got to move beyond being worldly people. There are no such things as worldly Christians. That's just a worldly man, a worldly woman. That's just a person of the world, period. There are no worldly Christians. Those that truly belong to Christ want to do everything to be accepted and acceptable to him. Because only through that can we truly come to know the Father. If we're a disappointment to Jesus, we're going to end up standing in front of God. And that's not going to be pleasant. When he starts playing back all those things that we've done, all that history that you think nobody else knows about, he does. All that stuff from when you were 6, 9, 13, 17, 27, he's got it all. And it's going to play back. And then you're going to go to hell. Where you get to think about it and play it over and over and over and over. Because we made the wrong choice. We didn't want to heed his call. We didn't want to become who we were to become. To be of service to him in accordance with his will, not ours. Pride is a huge stumbling block for all of us. Because from pride stems a multitude of sin. The inability to be humble, display humility, to understand when we're being vain or exhibiting vain characteristics or behaviors, to understand to not understand when our anger has gone too far. It started out as frustration or irritation, became anger, and then something flew out of our mouth. Or we got stubborn. We do realize that stubbornness is also sinful behavior. Because through that stubbornness, we won't be obedient and do what we're told to do. Think about when your children won't do what you tell them to do. Aggravates you, doesn't it? How do you think God's feeling after letting his son come down here and die? And we're still disobedient. We still won't do what we're supposed to do. We still just can't even talk to each other. Correct each other when we need to be corrected. At the moment, it, we need the correction. We'll just let it go on. Just let it play out. It'll take care of itself. Somebody else will deal with it. Somebody else has been around since Adam and Eve. We have to do it. He expects us to do it. It's our responsibility. That's why he's given us the Holy Ghost. To teach us, to show us, to help us understand what we're supposed to do. We've got to get off the fence. You know, Jesus tells us, he who puts one hand on the plow and looks back, how many of us have done that? Maybe not in the beginning, but have we looked back since? Are we looking back right now? When we do things out of love, Tony spoke of this this morning, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. We don't know how to love. Until we know Christ, we don't know how to love. All we know how to do is want things. Things that we don't need. But the Spirit will lead us to the understanding of what true love is and how to be of service to others and to love others, to care about others and put the service of others ahead of ourselves. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Jesus did that. But we can't take out the garbage when we're told to. What's that say? 
We can't lend a hand without somebody telling us. What's that say? We can't talk to one another about the problems we have with each other like we're supposed to, like we've been told to. What's that say? It's difficult to truly examine yourself. And that's what we have to do. We have to truly take a look at ourselves. Not based on what we think or what we we hope we know. We need to look at the scripture and measure ourselves to what we're supposed to be. What does God tell us we're to be? How are, how are we to be if we're to be an inheritor, a child of God? What does that look like? What do we need to know? What do we need to do to know with certainty, to have that peace and that comfort of knowing we belong to him? That's how you examine yourself. Okay. And if you're still doing all these other things that Paul tells us are of the carnal man, we're not where we're supposed to be. We're still struggling. We're still trying to gain control Instead of letting the spirit take control, the spirit's got to take over. When Jesus was the final sacrifice, in the beginning, they sacrificed animals, the sprinkling of the blood, for the atonement of sin. Jesus came and gave his life. Have we thanked him for that? Have we really knelt down and said, Thank you, Lord Jesus? For what you gave to me. And really let that strike home. Do you know anyone else that sacrificed their life for you? He was in the kingdom of heaven. Richest place? No. And he left us to become poor and walk down here with us so that we can be forgiven for past sins, present, and future. We really need to think about that. We really need to consider that. And one thing I want to make clear, too. I hear a lot of uncertainty about the call. The call to Jesus. The call comes through carrying the gospel. God's placing it on your heart. You may hear it. <coughs> you may be reading the word of God and the recognition and understanding comes. The call comes in many forms. We need to heed the call when it comes so that we can begin to understand what we're to do next. The word of God speaks to you every time you open it up. It speaks to you when someone preaches it to you, when someone teaches in Bible study. God is speaking to us all the time. The problem is, we're not listening. We're too busy listening to ourselves. If we're unsure whether we're saved or not, you don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to say a prayer. I've heard that happens a lot. You don't even have to have a conversation with anyone else other than God, other than Jesus, and ask him to receive you. But it really needs to be from the heart. You can't be holding on to something else saying, I really want to try this out, Jesus. We need to understand that we need to give ourselves over to him to be acceptable so that he knows he now has a vessel to fill. Because if you're holding on to all your old junk, you can't put new wine in an old glass. It's got to be clean. It's got to be from the heart. And God knows the heart. 
Don't ever doubt it. He knows it. I read for four months before he finally put the call on me to come. It took four months of continuous reading every day in my case, a different prayer book, to empty it out, to understand I needed to let so many things go. Just to be prepared to be accepted. I didn't get anything else. I just got accepted. It's spiritual. It's not worldly, it's spiritual. And as long as we keep blending the two, we're not truly giving over to him. And that's what we need to understand. Let's bow our heads and pray. Glorious Holy Father. I thank you for this message. I thank you for all the things that are revealed to me in my life that I need to correct. And the teachings that came along with it. That I might know how to share with others. I thank you for the guidance in delivering the message and knowing when to shut up. I pray that everyone that needed to hear something was able to hear it. That their hearts and their ears were open. And that you'll be with them to help them understand what the <coughs> next steps are. So that we can all truly, truly be the spiritual men that we are to be. To guide others, to help others come to you. In Jesus' name we pray.